Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where in the world you are. Um, we're in uh, New York City and uh, Brooklyn, respectively. So we're on East Coast, one o'clock Eastern. My name is Dana Ostemel. I am the founder and CEO of Deposit a Gift, and I am so, so excited to be here because today uh, marks what I think is a really momentous day, which is the six month countdown to Giving Tuesday. Exactly. Um, and so uh, we've become good friends with the people over at, at givingtuesday.org. And I was really um, honored that they gave us the opportunity to uh, lead their kickoff webinar. Um, and we were brainstorming all different kinds of things, what we thought would be most useful to people. But um, what I said is, you know, I really think we need to teach people how to maximize this next six months so that you have the time that you need to really plan things out right. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And I'm also really happy to have with me uh, my friend Sal, who is the founder of Crowd Crux. Um, and uh, Sal and I have done a few webinars together. So just for perspective, I run a crowdfunding platform that you can actually use for your Giving Tuesday campaign. Sal actually is like the, you know, that third party um, uh, person who, who is a writer, really, and a blogger, and has become um, a huge authority in the crowdfunding space. So I always appreciate um, his perspective, and I wanted to have him here today um, to, well, first of all, we did a lot of preparation for this, and I think <laughs> we came up with a pretty gangbusters um, piece of content for you. But also, um, Sal has a real gift for putting himself in, really, in your shoes um, and sort of being the, the voice of the campaign organizer. Um, and so that's actually the role that he's going to um, help uh, play today. Um, and he's going to be the Q&A facilitator. He's going to be answering some of your questions via chat and also cherry picking the ones um, that we're going to be answering out loud. So with that, I'd just like to turn it over to Sal for a second. Hey guys, it's uh, great to be here on this webinar. Dana, thank you also for that intro. It is something I love. Um, I really love audience interaction. And that's something I'll be doing on this webinar. You can type, you can text uh, in the chat box there. If you have any questions you'd like to answer, we're going to be asking and going over some questions in the middle of the webinar and also at the end, just so that we make sure we're covering content that is relevant to everyone. And really, I think that's what it comes back to is um, with me, my blog, crowdcrux.com, my podcast, the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. We're here to serve you as you go out there into the world, raising money or just impacting lives in general. And it's something that we really do love to do. So we want to make sure that you are getting the most out of, this web out of this webinar and also on Giving Tuesday that you just have all the tools and the techniques that you need to make the most of that day. So we're, we're very excited to get to, to some of this content. But again, my name is Salvador Brigman, and I'm going to be looking at some of the questions that you type here in the box. Uh, and I couldn't be more excited. Thank you so much, Dana, for inviting me on the webinar also. Absolutely. So guys, a couple of things. You should all practice using that text box um, while we're doing an intro here. You look in your bottom left corner. It says type your message here. Say hello. Say what organization you're from, where you're from. Let's just get a little interaction going. And also, um, you want to get some practice typing so that we know that uh, that it works. I want to make sure that there's a uh... – oh, good. We've got people from Brazil. Yeah, we've got already – um, I know almost 300 people registered for this webinar, and already we've got over 100 people in here. So hi, everyone. Um, let's get started. This is going to be a meaty, meaty webinar. Um, if you've ever heard me speak before, then you know there's nothing that I um, despise more than fluffy webinars where you walk away saying, what did I just do for the last hour? What a freaking waste of my time. So i um, hoping that you don't say that when this is over. Sal, one little tidbit to share with you is um, when you are not speaking or facilitating, if you could mute yourself, because I know you're going to yeah, be doing definitely. some chatting. If you do anything in the chat box, you just don't want to hear the typing, and Sal is, is going to be doing that up. Okay, guys, so let's dive right in here. As I said, we're all here today because today is the six-month countdown to Giving Tuesday, and what we want to do is really teach you the strategies and tactics to make the most of the next six months. Um, we have a very um, dense and information-packed webinar, so one thing I want to tell you to put your mind at ease is that 
when this is over, you will get the recording and the slides. So my recommendation is to grab a piece of paper and take lots of notes. I know it's very old school, but I still think when you, you know, hand to mind makes a big difference in committing to memory. And then you'll be able to review this um, at your leisure. Um, my goal is to send this to you by tonight Eastern. Um, because we have to wait for the webinar to render and then post it. Um, and I will send it out as a personal email. I will send it mass, but it will come from my personal email address. I don't want you to think it's a bot sending it out. So reply and say hi and let me know what you think of it. Um, if you don't see the email in your inbox, check your spam folder. It will be coming from me personally. And I'll just put my email up here again. It's Dana at depositagift.com. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is quickly start off with a couple of polls just to get a sense for who's out there and what you are thinking. So the first question I have for you is who has experience running a, a Giving Tuesday campaign. If you could just choose either I have run a Giving Tuesday campaign or I have not run a Giving Tuesday campaign, that would be great. I'm going to keep this open for just a couple seconds and I will stop the voting. Great. So it looks like based on respondents, we have 64% of you who responded have not run a campaign. Um, so more of the majority. And even though Giving Tuesday is in its um, fifth year now and really kind of starting to get its sea legs, um, I think both organizationally and around the world with people getting into it, it's still relatively new. So if you haven't done it before, don't feel bad. If you did it once and you thought your campaign tanked, don't feel bad. If it did okay, that's, you know, we're here to always um, – to learn how we can grow and get better. My second poll for you is, what is your experience with crowdfunding? So either I consider myself very experienced and I run a successful campaign. So I'm put a question mark there, sorry about that. I run a campaign but did not get the results I wanted. I understand what crowdfunding is but have never run a campaign or I have very little experience with crowdfunding and I'm here to learn all about it. I'm going to keep voting. And I know the people who are on the phone, and we've got about 13 of you so far. I know you can't vote. Sorry, guys. But feel free to, uh, to send us any comments when, uh, when we email. All right. I'm going to stop the voting here. It looks like we are uh, – all right. I'll tell you here. We've got about 39%, very little experience. 28% of you understand what crowdfunding is is, but I've never run a campaign. I guess we could really say that between between very little experience and never run a campaign, about 70% of you have never run a campaign before, um, which is very normal. And about 30% of you have run them, um, but the majority of you didn't get the results that you wanted. Only 7% 7, 7 of you feel experienced and that you've done this successfully. Um, and so what I'd like to share is that Actually, these results are um, as predicted for me. I don't know how you feel when you're sitting on the other end, um, but the the reason that we're here is to help you feel empowered and to give you a lot of information because the truth is that most people don't really know what it takes to make a campaign go, um, and uh, that's the reason that they're not achieving the results that they want. Now, there are various angles that we could approach um, a webinar from in terms of teaching you what does it take to make a campaign go. Um, I often do crowdfunding 101 workshops or more advanced ones. I just did a great one with Sal uh, a couple weeks ago that you can find on our YouTube channels that was a bit more advanced. Um, and that's where we get into the nuts and bolts of like, literally, what do you do to run your campaign? Okay. But today we're actually going to talk more about um, the fact that you've got six months on your side to really cultivate and make it much more of the focus here is going to be what do you need to do to cultivate your community and less on what do I need to do to set up a campaign. If you want to know about that stuff, just hit me up in, via email and I can send you more webinars on that. It's not a problem, okay? What Sal and I really want you to do is to envision yourself as this little person, all right? Six months and one day from now, you will be the superhero. Okay. What it, one of the things that I think is really neat about what we're going to talk about today is that it's about Giving Tuesday, but it's about so much more than that, right? And I think even the people 
at givingtuesday.org would agree that they're really here to help this become a more giving environment. You know, they created this amazing day of giving um, and hoping that it's really not just about one day, but about creating a movement, a movement for change. And so what Sal and I are hoping is that what you learn here today can impact your trajectory on how you do crowdfunding in general, how you do fundraising, how you relate to your community. So whether you take what we talk about today and only apply it to your Giving Tuesday campaign, um, what you're going to find is it's going to set you off on just this incredible trajectory for the following year because you will have changed fundamentally how you relate with your community. If you have a campaign coming up sooner that you need to get up, which you can talk to me about offline, for the summer, for the fall, right? Like you've got other stuff you've got to get done even before Giving Tuesday happens. You will be able to apply these basic tenets. Now, Devin Thorpe is um, an expert in the field who I really love. He coins himself as a fundraising and social good expert. And he says this, that while crowdfunding does not constitute a complete development plan, that in today's world, no development plan is complete without crowdfunding. And, you know, I think that's the reason for this is that the landscape for fundraising has fundamentally shifted, right? And the way that people have become accustomed to being asked to support something and what it takes to create a movement has changed. What this means for you is the following, that your first crowdfunding campaign for the 70% of you on the line who've never done it before, your first crowdfunding campaign will not be your last. And that's a good thing, right? Because this is a platform for creativity. It's about experimentation. It's really more art than science right now. And you're going to look at it as like a one foot in front of the other kind of thing. Sal and I are going to really give you a poo-poo platter. I tried to lay it out as like a a 10-step roadmap for what you need to do. And at the end, we're going to have some homework for you to make this as actionable as possible. It's quite possible, though, that you're going to say, you know what? I can only do steps one and two right now. That's where we're at. And that's completely fine. Okay? And so knowing that your first crowdfunding campaign will not be your last, to me, takes a little bit of the pressure off because you're going to obviously do your darndest. You're going to set out your goals and what you think your metrics for success are, but then you're going to pick what's doable for you to achieve those now. And then you'll use the results of that initial campaign to build onto the next one. As we said before, we are really hoping for a lot of interaction in q and A. I I am totally leaving in that in Sal's hands because if I look down in the corner and I see all the typing, I'm going to get just completely distracted. But this webinar and really what you get out of it, I, I think a lot of it's going to come from the Q&A and the questions um, just because some of you may have some very specific things that you'd like to know that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and that helps us get better and it helps you guys help each other, which is what being part of the Giving Tuesday community is all about. So let's dive right in. What I think is really cool about today being the six month countdown to Giving Tuesday is that time is on your side, right? A lot of what we're gonna talk about today is about using time to set yourself up for success so that you're not rushed because crowdfunding, forget, it just being Giving Tuesday, crowdfunding in general is all about relationships. It's all about being able to work your crowd or work your network, okay? Relationships take time. It's not something instantaneous, right? And I think, I mean, I think you can even think about this in um, the context of networking, right? Or when you need something, you're looking for a new job or you need a piece of information. If you write to someone that you haven't been in touch with for a while and you sort of don't play the game a little bit and leave some time for a little back and forth and you write to them and you just cut straight to the nut of what you want, you often aren't going to get the same response. They may not even reply to you at all because people might feel used, right? And the whole idea here is to create a reciprocal relationship where you really put out a lot of goodwill 
without asking for anything up front, right? And anyone who's a good networker or anyone who's really, maybe you're not a good network worker, but you know someone who is and you sort of watch them in awe, right? What makes a good networker? A good networker is always thinking about what they can give to others without asking for anything in exchange. Now, most of the times they do that because actually they get just personal joy out of it, you know, if that's just kind of part of your DNA. But if it's not something that comes naturally to you, and it doesn't come naturally really to a lot of people, I think that what we go through today is going to be quite useful to help you change your mindset and understand, okay, so what does it take to cultivate reciprocity, to cultivate relationships where people want to do something for you? And I would challenge any of you who feel sort of internally like you want to resist against that idea because maybe it feels contrived to you. If you want to do this well, you sort of need to accept that that's the way that it works, right? You need to give before asking to have it go well. So the focus of your next six months is going to be about investing in your network. You need people to care about your cause. You need people to take action when you ask, and you need people to advocate for you, right? People to share for you. And most people are not going to do this unprompted. So you need to create the foundation that allows for them to do this. Now, if you've ever seen me present before, you've probably seen this slide. This is sort of my, um, my coining of a continuum where I think um, communities lie. Lurkers, supporters, and advocates. Your job as a campaign organizer when you're in the heat of a campaign or as a community organizer when you are just managing your community when you're not in the heat of a campaign, right? What you are trying to do is move people along a continuum from being a lurker to a supporter to an advocate. Lurkers are people who have opted in to follow you on social media or opted in to be part of your newsletter. But they are people who have typically not taken action. And often the action that you want them to take is donating, but it might be other kinds of action, right? You've never been able to hook them in. Supporters, in the context of fundraising, will say that they are people who have donated at least once. And advocates are the people who sing your praises, okay? Now, one myth within crowdfunding or sort of, I guess, a misnomer that a lot of people have is they think about crowdfunding and they think that it's about the crowd and they think less about the people they have access to and more about oh well to be successful in crowdfunding you need to publicize this to all sorts of people who have no idea who we are and get them to be part of the network when in fact if you look at um, your let's say your email list and you ask yourself okay well what percentage of people typically respond to our newsletters or what percentage of people typically make a donation when we ask to ask them to and the percentage is typically relatively small lots of times it's the same people maybe it's 10 percent 15 percent 25 percent all right what we are trying to teach you is actually how to move the masses of the people who've already raised their hands and said, well, I am remotely interested in what you do, so I'm on your email list and I'm following you on social media. Make me care enough to actually want to take action and give when you ask me to. Make me care enough to start being an advocate so that I tell my friends about you. So it's less about having your eye on the prize of all of these random people out in the world and more about squeezing the juice out of the people that you already have access to. And then from there, as you turn people from a lurker to a supporter who donates to an advocate, which is someone that you can get to help share your campaign, invite others to get part of the movement, to become part of the movement, when you get your inside core people to do that, when they advocate for you and they bring in their people, that's when your crowd starts to build. So... Join us in the thinking that you're going to change your mindset about what crowdfunding is and that it's really about starting with your core and building out. Okay, so we've got a 10-step roadmap all about the people part. The I would say the last 20% of this uh, webinar will be about sort of the, the business part, setting up your campaign and that kind of thing. What we're talking about here is investing in, in the upfront part, which 
for many people might feel funny because you haven't done it before. It might feel um, very like far and long a long time away, I guess, is not saying it very eloquently. But basically, when you can measure an action of, I asked someone to donate, they gave, right? And so there's this uh, propensity to want to sort of jump to the ask. And what we're going to really encourage you to do is start with the stuff that may be a little bit more difficult to measure at first. Although I think you're going to find some suggestions in here about um, actions that you can ask people to take to really know if you're making headway on getting your community more engaged. And what you're doing is really laying the foundation for a hyper-engaged community so that when you do go to make the big ask for them to donate to your campaign and when you go to make potentially the even bigger ask for them to share your campaign, they're ready. Why is asking them to share your campaign even a bigger ask? It might come as a surprise to some people, but this idea of your community's social capital and the value of it um, in some ways, it could be even greater than what somebody donates, right? The amount of people that one of your community members has access to and their willingness to sing your praises to those people um, could be the difference between how many people donate to your campaign or if you hit your goals. And so what you're doing is investing in those people so they feel like they want to do that for you, which is what you really want. So what I tried to do is um, break down these 10 steps into what I see as like the objective and the strategy. So I've got like a pretty picture for each 10 step. And then the next slide behind are, is more the text because I want you guys to actually be able to print this and almost look at it as like a workbook to say, okay, what's my objective? Is my objective to get to know my donors? Here's the strategy that Dana and Sal are recommending. Let me see how I can interpret that for my context for my organization and implement it. And then what we did is we came up with a list of tactics um, to give you some ideas about how you could go about implementing it. It's a lot of information. We're going to really kind of speed through it. All right. So step one, it may be obvious, but get to know your donors. Okay. The strategy here is about profiling your community. Um, I was doing a lot of reading recently on this idea of building donor personas and how there has been a lot of um, research lately that the organizations that take the time to invest in building donor personas, which is basically pulling your, your donor base and segmenting them into different kinds of people and really being able to understand what they respond well to um, so that you can then create your outreach plan based on that, that it has made a, a major difference in converting to, let's say, the first donation, but also made a major difference with retention, which is something that a lot of organizations struggle with. And the other key thing for this slide, <clears throat> excuse me, that you'll want to take away here is embracing the psychology of giving and that it is um, intensely ego-driven, right? And it's um, you probably all know this, but I think it's important to really put it at the forefront of your mind that people give to feel good. They give really for themselves. And so if you can, in building those donor personas, understand what drives your community to get involved and to give, uh, you are going to be much better off in how you're able to approach them. But a key thing is also that you cannot have that gratifying experience that comes from giving if you're missing one element. And that one element is appreciation. Um, I've been reading a lot of studies and I've seen some workshops given by the, the great folks over at Bloomerang. And they've talked a lot about, um, they do these top 10 lists of like, what are the 10 things that keep people from coming back and giving again, right? That difference between being a first time donor and a repeat donor. Once you get people to be a repeat donor, they're much more hooked in. The big jump is between the first time donation and the second time donation. The three out of the 10 reasons why people don't give again are, are iterations on not feeling appreciated or feeling like their support mattered. So you are going to hear us talk about that throughout various slides, right? There's 10 items here in our roadmap, but there, there's all always overlap. Um, as you figure out 
who your people are, what drives them, how they like to be communicated. Keep in mind that everyone wants to be acknowledged. And so you need to layer in a ton of appreciation on top of any outreach effort that you do. Okay. Some of those outreach efforts are going to be online. If you have the opportunity to hold any friend raisers during the six month period where you can make personal contact, invite people to things, make them feel part of the community, that will make a huge difference. If you can use the time to make exploratory calls and surveys and maybe couple that with you, the reason you're calling is to say thank you. And oh, by the way, we'd really love your input on X, Y, or Z and make them feel important. That's going to go a long way. All right. Step two in our roadmap is cultivating your network. Understanding that your strategy needs to be about building, rekindling, and maintaining relationships, which actually might feel kind of hard because that's a lot to do. Um, what you're going to be focused on is building goodwill and giving without asking. This is what I call karmic networking because I'm a big networker. I actually am one of those people who gets a little bit of a high off of, of connecting the right people and um, introducing people um, a little bit geeky that way. But one of the best ways to do it is to just, you know, to be able to write to people and say, hey, I was thinking of you and I read this article I thought you would really like. Oh, I was thinking of you and I was um, walking by the new building the other day and I saw that they made some progress. They took a picture to send it to you so you could see how, you know, the donation that you gave last year is actually being put to good use, okay? So I want you to think of a few different things. First of all, you're going to take a major accounting of your networks. And as part of that donor persona, you could also just call that segmentation and figuring out who needs a touch point, what kind of touch point. You're going to do it both in mass and in personal ways, right? And so I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I often find that people get really lost. They get caught up in the crowd of crowdfunding, thinking that everything is about mass messaging, when actually so much of this is about personal relationships. So as much as you can do to cultivate your community through personal relationships um, during the six months period, you should. Now, you might say, well, I'm a one-man band. Like, you know, what do I do? But the thing is, you're probably not as alone as you think you are. Maybe you're the only staff person. Maybe you guys are all volunteer-led, but you probably have a board. You probably have some volunteers. I mean, if you don't have anyone, then you have no community. You probably don't have an organization yet, right? So. You've got to think of ways to connect. I was at a conference recently where someone said, you know, it's great when staff people call volunteers or donors or potential donors, but it's even more impactful when volunteers or board members make those calls because the perception on the other end might be, well, you know, they pay you, you have to call us, but you're a volunteer and you just took the time to make a phone call to me. Like, wow, that really makes an impression. Right. So the more that you can make personal impressions that way, the better. And one challenge that I have for you is um, reach out to one new contact a day between now and Giving Tuesday. I counted the days. I hope I didn't uh, miscount. But I believe that if you start tomorrow, that that would connect you with 189 new contacts. So that might be people that you have just lost touch with. That might be um people who've donated in the last year that you want to make feel appreciated. You figure out what those contacts would be. Um, but one a day, just say hi, reach out. How are you doing? What can I do for you? And see how that pans out for you. All right. Step three in your roadmap is to be social and communicative on the regular. This step is so important that I actually wanted to pause for a second to bring up another expert in the field who I think is really awesome. And this is Jay Love. He actually um, originally was the um, founder and CEO of eTapestry, which a lot of you um, may know. And he sold that business. And then he since um, developed Bloomerang, which is um, a CRM system that works really well for small to medium sized organizations. And he is... Um, really spot on in this quote that I wanted to share, which is, since loyalty is based upon strong relationships and relationships grow via proper and regular communications, efforts in this area can provide huge 
upward surges in loyalty and financial support. Okay. What he is saying is that when you communicate consistently and regularly and with a lot of gratitude and giving, right, you're building a relationship, you're building trust. People do things for people that they like. It, it's as simple as that, right? It's just human nature. You are investing in creating relationships where people have the warm fuzzies about you. So one thing I find is that a lot of organizations are not communicating regularly. You guys are so busy doing so much good, good work out there that you're like, I don't have time to write a newsletter. And I totally get that. I don't have time to do social media. I get that. But here's the thing. Of all the things we're going to put out here, and you're going to evaluate what you're doing and what you're not, what you have bandwidth for, I cannot encourage you enough to carve out time to come up with a consistent communications plan, to hire an intern, to give that go-getter in your office who is not really doing things that are, um, you know, that fun for them and give them opportunity to take the lead on the communications plan. You know, sometimes I find organizations, they're not doing it, but then the most senior person wants to be in charge of this, but they don't have time for it. Instead of giving it to someone who's got the time, the energy, the innovation at whatever level that might be and let them come up with it because honestly, communicating it all is, I mean, unless you say something horrible, which I trust you wouldn't do that, communicating it all is better than not communicating, right? And so you got to come up with a consistent communications plan that you can commit to, whether it's a weekly newsletter, a bi-weekly newsletter, or monthly. If we're talking within the context of preparing for Giving Tuesday, you are not in a situation to be able to afford yourself just a quarterly newsletter. It's not going to cut it, okay? Think about it this way. If you did a monthly one, you could get out five to six, depending on how your calendar lays out before Giving Tuesday happens. And in those newsletters, you are building goodwill. You are putting a face on your organization. You are telling stories. You are giving. You are showing impact. Okay, that's what you need to do. You need to have people feel like um, their support matters, like you are doing um, the work that you said that you would be doing. Make them feel good about you guys, okay? Heavy, heavy on storytelling, heavy on pictures. If you can do video, great. Don't pressure yourself to hire some professional video editor. Quick little videos on your webcam are just fine. People want to feel like they know you, okay? And I guess really to take the pressure off, I would say like have fun with it, you know? And make it easy. Get it, you know, if you haven't really started using a third-party email system, MailChimp is a great and easy system. In fact, it's free, I think, up until like 2,000 email addresses. And they have templates that you can just drag and drop and plug and play. Um, but I think that you will be surprised um, what you can train your audience to do if you communicate with them regularly. You're creating a more – oh, yes, I want to jump in there. Yeah, I just want to jump in because we've been getting some really great questions in the chat. And also, I see that some people have been networking, too, in the chat. So they're really taking that advice to heart and making awesome. new contacts. Um, I want to invite anyone, if you have a question, can you please leave it in the chat here? We'll take, like, maybe one to three questions before we move on. Okay. But the one that I did, you know, have stuck in my mind, if you are a small nonprofit, you don't have a budget, you're thinking... I don't know marketing. I'm not a marketing professional. Would you recommend that that person has to get someone to help with this? Is this just something they have to learn on the, their own and really just commit to mastering this? What are your thoughts on that? Because I do think a lot of people want assistance in some way, but also can't really afford it. Right. Well, I mean, we're lucky in 2016 how much free information we have out here. Like this webinar, like stuff on crowdcrux.com. I've done tons of workshops that are recorded that are just like crowdfunding 101s. You know, something that's different in the nonprofit space now than it was a few years ago is that marketing and development are not separated anymore. So whether you come from an organization where there's actually departments and they're separated or you are a very small shop and everyone's kind of doing everything, you need to actually think of them as one. Now, 
do I think everyone needs to be good at everything? And is that realistic? No. Do you need to learn the, if, if you are responsible for growing your organization and raising money, which I assume the majority of people on here are, then you do on some level need to educate yourself on um, marketing, communications, how to cultivate a community, which really happens a lot online. You can do some offline cultivation, but you got to reinforce it online. Um, and workshops like this are geared to help you learn that. But I do think you need to learn it. And then recognize that there actually are a lot of people who want to help you. You've got to put it out there. A lot of people, even if they say no one wants to help, sometimes those people are afraid of delegating or bringing other people in. So you got to be honest with yourself about when you say no one wants to help, does no one really want to help or are you not comfortable managing people or bringing them in to help. Um, there are awesome. so many young people who want experience. There are so many boomers who are mm. bored and retired and want something to do, right? You got to put the exactly. call out there. I think too, also with my blog, just to give people an idea of the volume of content I do, I do one new bit of content every single day. I do a new blog post. I put out podcasts, YouTube videos. And what I found to really help cut down on the time needed to manage social media is using social media automation tools like Buffer or Hootsuite. They're really inexpensive. In many cases, they are free for the lower tiers, but you can just have that schedule out an interesting question every single day, or you can have a message scheduled out. There are a lot of tools nowadays to really automate a lot of this, and you can even schedule newsletters so that you can schedule one going out every single week and then you don't have to think about it for the rest of the month. And how great is that? It's another yep. cognitive load off and you can focus on something else. But that, that was another question we were seeing in the chat here is if you do have a small, small social footprint, can you really do this? Like if you don't have a lot of followers, what is your advice to someone in that kind of a position? Well, if you're saying, can you really do this? Meaning, can you do Giving Tuesday? The reason that we're having this conversation right now is that you can, so you can work on your social following. Um, I think you and I both agree that if, you know, whether we're talking about launching a campaign to raise money for a film in the for-profit world or to raise money for an organization, some people are ready to do that tomorrow and some people are not. And they have work that they need to do. And the difference between who is ready to launch a campaign now and who is not is if you have a network a responsive, cultivated network. And so if you if that wasn't clear before, I, I'm glad you asked the question. That's what we're talking about right now. You have six months to grow your social following and beyond, right? But if we're just looking yeah, at like perfect. Giving Tuesday as, you know, step one. So it's about starting with the people you have, riling mm. up the people who are super passionate, getting them to be advocates. And you can't, you know, I think one mistake that people make is, and I'm trying to communicate this as we get further into it, but sometimes people don't hear it because I really think they think, oh, it's the internet. Virality just happens on its own. I'm just going to put it up and people are going to respond, right? Then they post something to Facebook and nobody likes it. Nobody shares it. And you're just like, what happened? It's, exactly. You actually have to control that to a degree. You have to send a private email to 10 friends and say, Hey, I'm posting the first post about, you know, our upcoming campaign. Will you make sure that you click the like button? Would you do me a favor and write a comment like, awesome. That's so neat. Congrats. Why? Mm -hmm. Because all of these social media platforms are built algorithmically and they don't share your content unless they think people will think it's interesting. You have to work to make it interesting. You have to actually show that people are interested. And so sometimes that takes a little bit of manhandling, Very, yeah. a little contrived controlling. Very well said. Uh, the last thing I want to say before we just move on here is thank you. Also, Jess Ames from uh, Pennsylvania. Seems like you've been sharing a lot of great advice in the chat. Uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you, everyone, for just sharing what tools you use or anything that you've learned with your organization. The last thing I would say is with Giving Tuesday, there is a lot of focus on social media. But at the same time, the great thing about even having a small social following is you can get those people on your email list. You can get them to engage with you 
And when you do have this dedicated email list, you can have people show up at a specific place at a specific time and do a specific thing. And it really, you know, you think that there are fans outpouring here, but really you're asking people to uh, align or assemble for one specific cause. And that's really where I think we see a lot of activity in the social realm. So you don't need a really big uh, social following to get everyone aligned, get your ducks in a row for one singular event. Uh, right. But that's, yeah, that's all I had to say. Again, we encourage you to, to share more questions in the chat here. Um, and let's, let's uh, continue because there's a lot more good information. All right. One thing I did notice, a quick question. I know I said I wasn't going to look down, but I saw it and this is worth we're talking about. Somebody said that they did Giving Tuesday last year and they felt like it diluted year-end donations. Um, here's what I would say about that. And I usually coach on that in a, in a different webinar that's more tactical that I'll probably start doing in like September. But um, Giving Tuesday is not meant to be just about one day. It's actually a, a movement for change. And for a lot of organizations, I really recommend that you use Giving Tuesday as like even the launching day for your year end giving campaign, right? So you create one campaign on a site like Deposit a Gift, you share the mission of what you're raising money for, you got to have a story, right? It shouldn't just be for operating budget, you got to have it feel emotional and meaty and urgent and actionable. And you use Giving Tuesday to kick that off. And then you keep it going through the end of the year because giving begets giving and you want to build momentum. It is confusing to people if you try and send them in too many directions. Only certain organizations I've seen do this well where they really isolate their Giving Tuesday campaign and it's only that one day and then they cut it off and maybe they run something else at the end of the year. But most organizations I see that have a lot of success and can want to be able to create something bigger that really they can show we made, you know, achieved a bigger goal. Sometimes they need a little bit more time. So giving Tuesday is almost like a jump start, right? And then you run it through the end of the year. All right. So what you're working on, right? The objective, like I said, I, I uh, created objective and strategy, focus and tactics. Okay. Your objective is to create a more engaged community. Cause like you were talking about, Sal, a lot of people don't have a big social media following. It is possible to grow that following. You're going to start with that key group of supporters. So the reason I chose that bullseye image is because I want you to think about your inner circle of key supporters, and it could literally be five or ten people. It might include your mom and dad and your siblings, and that's fine. Whoever it is, all of those people have more contacts. The average person, I think, has 20, 250 Facebook contacts. So imagine if you got... 10 people to each share with all their contacts, how that could reverberate. You want to get those most passionate inner circle of key supporters, and you're going to use them to network on your behalf. You're not the only person who's going to get the assignment in your organization to reach out to one new person a day. What happens if you did that to, to all of your board members and you asked five people to commit to reaching out to a new person a day? What would be the impact of that? Remember, like I said at the beginning, we're hoping to make you superheroes in six months and one day from now, but actually to really change the way you're doing things for the long term. So tactical ideas, just these are just thought starters. I'm sure there are even more ideas out there, maybe better ones, right? You can call or email some of those lurkers or people that you identify in, your, in those profiles as one-time supporters and engage them, right? You're going to actually actively engage your personal networks or your board. You're going to use people who are part of that, that inner circle, people who are super passionate about what you're doing. Profile those people. Create stories. I bet you there's a ton of content that you could get just by profiling staff members, profiling board members. Why are they involved? Why do they give their time and energy and their money to your organization? profile, you know, constituents who've really gone on to do great things as a result of what your organization does. You can also use that core group to invite people to events. You can't be the only one doing it. The way I like to see it is that you are the conductor of the orchestra. You need to build an orchestra. It might be two people. It might be five people. It might be 10. It might be 50. And you are going to conduct those people and you're going to give them assignments and things to do to help grow your network. So if you're sitting here listening, which I can tell from some of the questions Sal brought up, kind of feeling paralyzed, like, 
this feels so big. Like, I can't do this. We're too small. Our organization is too small. I would say that you have nonprofit itis. And this is what I hear when I do when I do workshops all the time and people can actually talk back to me. Often leading with the why we can't the barriers that we have. And I really would like to challenge you to use these next six months to just free yourself of those barriers. Have a wine and cheese party, have a pizza party, have a coffee party with your staff, your volunteers, whoever, and brainstorm as if you have no barriers. And think about these basic objectives and what can you do to achieve them. And you're not going to tackle all of them. It might be too much for you. You have to figure out what's doable for your organization. It is doable to send an email to someone once a day and say, how are you doing? What are you up to? When they reply and say what they're up to, then they're going to ask you, what are you up to? And then you're going to share, oh, well, I've been working at this organization or I joined this board and it's just been so fulfilling, right? You're not going to send people an email, just to be clear. Hi, what are you doing? Oh, I wanted to tell you I'm part of this organization. We're going to be doing Giving Tuesday this year. I hope I can count on your support. That is not networking. That is not give and take outreach. That's why you need six months. You need to be able to send casual communications to reestablish connections, to say that their kids on Facebook are really cute, to congratulate them on the new job that they got, to send them an article that you think they would find interesting. To be a giver, not make it about you. Because remember, it's really about them. And you want to keep the narrative that way, okay? Create a more engaged community through action. You want to humanize your organization. Put a face on who you are. Get personal and really work to engender likability. People help who they like, right? You don't want to feel like some big faceless, nameless, well, not nameless, but big faceless organization. And so there's a ton of stuff that you can do through that consistent communications plan that I'm saying is your number one priority. If you are not doing a newsletter and if you are not doing at least one post on Facebook a day, that is the first step to take. And you've got to have interesting information to share. And don't say that you don't have interesting information to share because you do. Okay, mine who you have, like I was talking about before, profile those board members, right? Take a picture of your office, like silly stuff. Like, I bet you wondered what it looks like where we work. Here's a picture of my desk, you know, starting the day right with coffee. What are you all drinking? Silly stuff, questions, okay? Showcase your staff, showcase your volunteers, showcase the people that you help. Be inspirational, okay? People don't like the woe is me, we're sucking, no one's giving to us, this is so terrible. Talk about the good things you're doing, the people who inspire you to come to work every day, the reason why so-and-so board member joined. Share those stories, okay? Create color and connections around your people and your cause and offer opportunities to interact with you. So it might be a question that you put out there. And by the way, you might say, well, I'm afraid to put a question up because then I'm going to hear crickets, okay? That's why you have to tell five people, hey, by the way, I'm going to post a question today. Would you please answer my question so that it doesn't look like no one cares? And this is called creating social proof. And the more social proof you create, the more other people will say, oh, that's normal to engage with that organization. I'm going to do that too. Sometimes you have to make it a little bit contrived at first. You got to ask someone to respond. You've got to ask someone to give during your soft launch in order to show that others are doing it too because people are sheep and it's a herd mentality. All right. Inciting action through commitment. So this is remember I I told you at the beginning we're going to talk a lot about different like psychological things, right? So one piece of it was understanding the psychology of giving. The other th- piece of it is understand Understanding the psychology of what gets someone to commit. So the foot in the door technique is where you ask people to take a small action to then get them to take a bigger one. So when Sal and I were brainstorming, he was telling me this story about how some researchers, and I went and was reading about it online, Sal, um, wanted to see what it would take to get someone to put a really ugly lawn sign on um, in front of their house that says they were in favor of safe driving. Okay, which most people are. 
Well, when they went and asked them, would you put this sign on your lawn? Most people said no. But if they went and asked them and said, we've got this tiny little sticker that says, I'm in favor of safe driving. Will you put it in your front window? A huge majority of people said yes. And then when they went back a couple of weeks later and said, okay, would you post this lawn sign? Like 70% of people said yes, they would do it. And the reason is because what you're doing is setting people up to not want to have cognitive dissonance, meaning if you ask them to do something small, like sign a petition or post about you in social media or wear your t-shirt or wear your colors, whatever it might be, wear a pin, um, opt into your email list, like something that really doesn't take much from them, okay? They now have a perception of themselves as, I am someone who supports X. I am a generous person, whatever it might be. When you then go back and ask them to do something bigger, if they are going to say no, it is in direct contrast to how they perceive themselves. And so they're going to be less um, likely to say no because they want to feel good. They don't want to have weird feelings. The way to make sure that this goes smoothly is that you've got to really um, show appreciation in the middle. So they do that small thing. You want to recognize them for it. You want to do a shout out on Facebook. You want to send them an email. You want to call them. We're so glad to have you on our email list. Thank you for signing the petition. Don't ask for anything. Just thank you. Thank you. The next time you come around and ask for something bigger, they're much more likely to do that. All right. I see we're getting close to the top of the hour and we have a lot of info to get to. So I'll just tell you guys now, probably going to go over by about 10 or 15 minutes. My apologies. Um, hope you can stick with us. If not, you'll get the recording at the end. All right. Generating loyalty through appreciation. Um, I got this slide from the folks at Bloomerang when they did this whole report, like I said, about why people don't come back. And you can see it's pretty startling why people don't come back after the first donation. But then what happens if they do two donations that they're more likely to do a third and a fourth, okay? The reason is very simple. Most organizations do not adequately say thank you. And with crowdfunding, if you watch any of my other workshops, you'll see that I often talk about creating an appreciation strategy. Because often organizations, I find this is a huge mistake, they look at gratitude as like a task. When the campaign's over, I'm going to send you a letter for your taxes, okay? People care about their taxes, but they don't. They want to feel important. They want to feel like their support mattered. And especially in a day and age where you can send an email really quickly, or you can post to social media and acknowledge someone publicly, or you can include a list of donors in your newsletter. Those are the types of actions where you can provide immediate gratitude, right? I call it basically curbing buyer's remorse, right? Which is a term you typically hear in real estate, but it really applies well to crowdfunding. You want to make people feel good about supporting you. And when we heard that quote from Jay Love earlier about how this is all about building relationships and relationships engender trust, the way you enhance relationships, it cannot be underscored enough, is through gratitude. So if you're going to prioritize what you can do, right, that you may not be doing, one is going to be communicating consistently, coming up with a plan for a newsletter and your social media. The next piece of it is figuring out how much gratitude can you shower on people over the next six months to make them feel really good, okay? My recommendation is to segment them into two audiences. Shower your past donors with a ton of love over the next six months and per the slide before, see if you can get them to take a small action, right, so that they re-kind of engage and feel committed. And then anyone that's a lurker, right, who hasn't really done anything, use maybe the first couple of months to try and get them to take an action. So it might be like a mini campaign to get everyone to sign a petition that says like, yes, I care about, you know, blind puppies or whatever it is. And spend the next three to four months showering those people with a lot of love. Mass love, meaning you shout it out on Facebook and they're actually recognized visibly to a lot of people. Personal love, they get a phone call, right? One idea I just heard at a conference that I thought was so brilliant that I wanted to share in point three, which is you can actually use your, your inner circle of key supporters, let's say like your board, to help make those phone calls. Because as I said before, getting a call from a volunteer sometimes goes further than getting a call 
from a staff member. So what if before a board meeting, you prepared five note cards per board member and said, okay, we're going to take 20 minutes and everyone is going to go call these people and say thank you. And also you'll have prepared some exploratory questions. So if you actually get them on the phone, you can ask what motivated you to give and what is it that you like about the organization? Anything you'd like to do differently? Hey, we're having a wine and cheese. We'd love for you to come. I'll be there. I'll meet you at the door so you feel comfortable, whatever it might be. And it also is going to really bolster how your board feels or your online street team feels because imagine coming back together after 20 minutes and being able to share some stories with each other really um, is a lot of positive reinforcement. So I cannot underscore enough that if you're going to figure out what to do with your valuable time to use it to show a lot of appreciation. All right. You're going to work on creating a sense of indebtedness. All right. Sal gave me um, an interesting story, and maybe this was generational. He goes, do you know who the Hare Krishnas are? And I said, of course I do. And then I'm thinking, oh, he's a millennial. I'm like whatever I am, Gen X or Y, and I'm used to seeing them all over the place. Maybe they're not out and about so much anymore. But he said, you know, I think in the 80s or 90s, they used to wait in airports and hand people flowers, right? And people would, and then they would want a donation. People would try to give the flower back, but then they felt like a jerk. So they would give a donation anyways and scurry away. I don't know if they still do that anymore, but it was a wonderful illustration of giving. So people feel like they owe you something to a degree. Okay. What you want to try and do is change the dynamic of your relationship. You're going to try and give away as much as you can. Doesn't mean you need to spend a lot of money. It could be giving your time. You're going to make a phone call. It could be a handwritten thank you note. It could be a virtual giveaway. Like, I think it's really funny when um, people were saying in the election right now that, you know, Hillary, I think Trump said Hillary's playing the woman card. So then Hillary's campaign came up with the woman card and they said, enter your email here and we'll give you a woman card. Well, I thought that was really funny. I never respond to stuff like this. And I went and I signed up because I wanted to get my woman card and actually I can't wait till it comes in the mail because I'm going to take a picture of myself with my woman card and I'm going to, you know, post it to my Facebook page. If you can do something funny and buzzworthy like that, you can probably actually get some social media reverberation too because people want to share. People like to share silly things. People like pictures and anything visual and humorous that can, you know, take their mind off whatever else is going on. What else can you give? Maybe you offer an opportunity for influence. People want that very much. Um, if you want to invest in something physical, maybe think about giving away something that would make you a daily presence in their lives. Like you give away a little notepad and on each piece of paper, it has either an inspirational quote or maybe it's a quote from um, a constituent or even a picture of like all the children you help. Each page, a different quote, a different picture so that they're inspired um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do where you can give and make people feel like, you know, like they should repay you in some way. I mean, even just giving interesting content, right? Even sending out a newsletter that says, we took the time to send you a newsletter to tell you how your dollars are working hard. That creates a sense of indebtedness. So don't think, um, especially if you're not doing much at all, you could get a lot of gains just by doing a newsletter. You want to raise your social profile, okay? Crowdfunding is all about social pressure, right? Well, and a lot of things are these days because we have these social tools where we can show who's supporting something, who's getting involved in something. And so your strategy here should actually be to exploit that because let's say you actually have a huge donor database, but it's mostly offline. Okay, and you're trying to change the culture of giving in your organization. If you do not manifest this online so that people can actually tell what's going on, right, and that you are as big as you say you are, or maybe you're not that big, but you want to look big, that's what you use the internet for. So your job here, you, you should be focused on is making your organization look as popular as possible. And that literally might be, you know, posting things and like I said, calling a friend and saying, hey, I need you to like my post. I need you to comment on it. I need to get some traction. When you are doing a campaign, you're going to do what we call a soft launch where you send out your campaign to key supporters before your big launch. And when it comes to Giving Tuesday, 
you're not going to launch on Giving Tuesday with a zero balance. You're probably going to launch your Giving Tuesday campaign a week before under the radar to people who you know will definitely give. You're going to get those people to take the action of giving. And then those are the people you're going to ask to help you share it that day. So just come up with different ways where you can acknowledge people publicly for getting involved in your organization so that you can show that you are a cause worth supporting. And finally, you're going to look to create empathy. Now, most of you probably do not work for organizations where what you are about is babies and animals, right? For those of you who work for organizations about babies and animals, you've got it easy, right? Because those are emotional triggers, but most of us don't have that benefit. What you have to do is to create empathy or create authority. Now, this may be a more advanced strategy. So for those of you who already have down a lot of the other things we've been talking earlier, you might focus on this slide. For others of you, you might say, you know what, this is uh, more than we can really deal with right now, or maybe we drop a stat or two into a newsletter, but it may not be your focus. The main thing here is that you're going to be trying to find ways to make people care enough to give. And sometimes it's going to take more than just your voice and your information to do that. You might need an outside corroborator to say, yes, the glaciers are melting and we need to make sure that we stop that. Or this other thing is really a problem. I was just watching, I think on 60 Minutes the other night, and there's this um, dolphin, the Akita dolphin, that there's like less than 100 in the world. And one of the quotes that somebody said, um, who's I think the person in Mexico in charge of the environmental affairs, and says, it is really hard to make people care about something they can't see. And so you got to come up with creative ways to make people care. So to sum it up, here's what you're going to be focused on over the next six months. It's about cultivating relationships, building brand awareness, creating relevance, bolstering your online image, and sowing goodwill chips that you can cash in. That's probably the most important thing. This is where you're going to spend the majority of your time over the next six months, but you also need to work on some actionable elements of the campaign itself. So we're going to breeze through that. This is kind of the business part, the campaign setup and marketing. So you're going to develop the campaign idea and the details. You've got to have an engaging story and a specific goal. You've got to create a marketing plan. And you need to have a prepared and a strategic leader. And you need both. You can't just be strategic but not really have mapped things out. And you could be the most prepared person, but if you spent time on details that are not on point with meeting your goals and objectives, then you're going to be veering off in the wrong direction. So to that end, you want to establish goals. You know, one of the things that's really neat about crowdfunding is that it is about raising money, but what else? And so you're going to get your team together or your family or whoever you've got access to and figure out what else do we want to get out of this campaign? Of course, we want to raise money, but are we trying to engage new donors? Are we trying to grow our email list? Is this something to modernize our image? Is this a PR stunt? Figure out what you're trying to get out of this. And then um, use that to hone your strategy. I think that it's really important to grasp that crowdfunding is not a, just about processing. This is not an apples to apples with your donate page. It's the reason why when you're doing a crowdfunding campaign or you're doing Giving Tuesday, you don't want to just send them to a PayPal page or to a donate button. You want to send them to a page that's mission specific, that's creative and speaks for itself that has visuals and tells a story. And so really have fun with this, guys. Like come up with what would be interesting, what would engage you if you were on the other end. One thing that can really motivate people are incentives, right? And I'm not necessarily talking about the perks you see people give away if they're raising money for a book or a film. I'm talking about incentives that drive the power of the crowd. A big one is donor matches. You might spend part of your next six months getting one, two, or three donor matches lined up so that during um, very strategic parts of your campaign, you say, if we can raise $500 in the next five hours, we've got a donor who's going to double it, right? And that's new and exciting news that you want to be able to share. So come up with what would be the right incentives. You can make a note to yourself that slide 39 is like your checklist for setting up your site. So as you work to set up the site, you can ask yourself, 
Do I have engaging visuals? Do we have brief, well-organized text? And what I think is the most important thing when you are looking at the site and you have other people look at it too, and that's something that at depositagift.com that we'll do for you, we'll actually review your site and give you feedback on the setup. Um, because if someone reads it and says, I don't feel like I must give today and not tomorrow, then you know you need to keep working on it. It's got to be crystal clear and it's got to make them feel like they must take out their credit card now. And if it doesn't, then you got to keep working. You're going to establish your marketing strategy. All right. It might be Giving Tuesday, but the internet is not going to shower you with money. There are not benevolent donors trolling the internet who just want to give you money. Campaigns do not take off by magic. You cannot just put it up and pray. This is something that is really strategic. Um, I've learned over the years that you can liken it to a capital campaign that you would never roll out without a very specific strategy about who are going to be your feet on the street, who are you going to approach first, what percentage do you want to be at for your capital campaign before you take it public, right? The same strategy is applied to crowdfunding, and yet often people sort of have in their mind like, oh, it's the internet. Things just go viral, okay? If anyone tells you they put up a campaign, you heard them interviewed in some article, and they said, you know, I don't know what happened. I just put my campaign up, and I woke up the next morning, and I had a bunch of money. They're totally lying, okay? They planned for that. They had people that asked to donate at a certain time, and they did it. And those are the same types of steps that you can take. So you're going to plant seeds in early fall. I spent the majority of this presentation talking about all this cultivation you're going to do in your community. But specifically, as you get a bit closer to the campaign, you're going to do things like build your online street team. You're going to educate on what Giving Tuesday is. You're going to be giving a heads up to people that you're going to be sending a ton of emails and please don't unsubscribe, right? This is why we're doing, doing it. This is why your support matters. Please stick with us and help us achieve their goal, our goals. When you sort of let people peek behind the curtain, they're more apt to help you. You're going to use the fall to recruit, recruit, recruit. So all those relationships and goodwill chips that you're, uh, that you're sowing here, um, you're going to use those to start asking people to be part of your online street team, to be your advocates and help you spread the word. And you're going to create a marketing plan. So if you want deeper information on this, just email me at Dana at depositagift.com and I can send you webinars to help you with this stuff. Um, anyone who does a Giving Tuesday campaign with us, we actually give you a workbook that shows you how to break down the nine weeks leading up to Giving Tuesday. But these are the basics, if you have no experience with marketing at all, to really help you think through what are the, the, marketing, um, the marketing pieces here. My email is Dana at depositagift.com. I'll type it. All right. So now what? This is the end, guys. What is your immediate next step? Sal and I said that this was going to be actionable. So I recommend that you have a kumbaya with yourself, okay? And I want you to really evaluate your bandwidth and solidify your action items. If you want, you can use me to hold yourself accountable and say, you know, and maybe I'll even, when I send the follow-up email, I'll make a note to myself. Write back and say what you think your action items are and what are you going to commit to and see if that helps. Maybe we'll even create a Facebook group for uh, checking in with each other. I don't know. I never really thought about that, but that could be something fun if you guys are interested. And then really be truthful with yourself about where you're at in the funnel of relationships with your community so that you can dive in and really start working those relationships. So Sal and I came up with a little bit of homework for you guys to make this doable. Um, we thought that you could pick one day a week to work on your Giving Tuesday strategy. So maybe you pick Thursdays or Fridays and you pick a two-hour window where you're going to try and work through some of this stuff. Use some of those tools that Sal suggested that you can pre-schedule. So getting newsletters ready, queuing up your social media for the following week, right? Use a block of time because we know that you guys have other things to do. And it's, uh, it's hard. You don't want to feel like this is taking over your life. But at the same time, it, you know, it's something that takes an investment and a lot of time. Um, and so what you want to do is break it down for yourself. Use the fact that the time is on your side. You've got the six months to make this happen. Um, just to close, and then we'll take some more questions. I want you to, guys to really feel like you can do this. Um, we just put up on our YouTube channel, which I think you can just search Deposit a Gift, but it's youtube.com forward slash Deposit a Gift. 
if uh, maybe Saul can write that and he can put his YouTube channel as well because he's got tons of info there. Um, but we just posted under success stories um, an interview that I did with Cheryl Hall of Mullen High School. Um, this is about a campaign that she just ran for um, an alumni fundraiser. And we get a lot of questions from schools about alumni campaigns because it's so challenging to reconnect with your alumni. And she did a bang up job, this really creative campaign that she did around March Madness. Um, her school also did Giving Tuesday with us. Uh, that was their first campaign. And I think that she gives a lot of really good ideas of sort of like, how do you think about this strategically? Um, and we're going to jump into some more Q&A. But if anyone has to go, one thing um, I want to tell you about is that I came up with a special code for this community and I will email it out as well. But so that you have it, um, if you want to do a campaign with Deposit a Gift and you want to um, be on um, a lower fee plan, we gave you a free upgrade worth $49. As it is, we're the crowdfunding platform with the lowest fees and this is giving you a lower fee. So it's GT Plan 16. It's good for two weeks. I'll put the expiration date in the email. I think it's June 7th. You got to get your campaign set up by then. But just so you know, you don't have to set up the whole campaign. You literally just need to secure your URL and get through step two of um, setup just to input the code. So you um, get the free upgrade before June 7th. And then you can come back and work on this like three months from now. It doesn't matter. But um, if you'd like to do a campaign, you can have a free code and free upgrade. Um, and we'll offer you tons of great support and be happy to support you in that way. So with that, Sal, I'll turn it back over to you for any yes. other questions. We have a lot of uh, great questions here. I also think a lot of the questions were also answered with the slides that people had in the beginning. Um, but I would invite people to leave, you know, one to three questions we'll be answering here. I know, Dana, you have to go in a little bit. Um, so it'd be great if we could get some the questions that you have that are still lingering in your mind. Uh, the things that you just really have been wanting to ask this entire presentation and that we haven't covered. But the other thing I wanted to say here was um, if you guys do want to check out my site, you can go to crowdcrux.com. Um, I do talk about fundraising in general. A lot of my background, honestly, is more on the marketing front, which is what we were talking about earlier. Um, a lot of what are called compliance marketing tactics. And these are ways to get people to take action in very specific ways, both the, you know, the reciprocity principle, um, like we were talking about earlier, really creating that sense of social proof. So that's really, I think, what my website is about. And I also posted my YouTube channel here in the chat. Um, but look, I think we one of the questions that we had was with regards to setting the goal. Um, do you have any advice for people out there to set a realistic goal or for the first, you know, someone doing this the first time, what kind of goals should they set monetarily? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a challenging one. And I actually look at it through a marketing lens. So I think you want to try and set something that's realistic yet aspirational. Uh, one thing to note is that busting through your goal is a good thing. So lots of times people worry that if they break through their goal that people are going to stop giving. And that's actually opposite, right? So giving begets giving and people want to be on the winning team. If they see that you are um, exceeding your goal, they want to keep giving. And it's really a marketing opportunity for you. So one of the organizations who uses us a lot, DeRote, um, the first year they did their Giving Tuesday campaign, I think at three o'clock that day, they called us and said, what do we do? We hit our goal. And we were like, awesome, double awesome. down, yeah. send an email. This is, a, this is an excuse to communicate and say, hey, everyone, you're amazing, right? You helped us reach our goal. We can already give you know, 100 cell phones to 100 seniors, whatever their campaign was. We're challenging you to double it right? Help us give away 200 cell phones to 200 seniors by the end of the day. And they actually did that. So when you think about your goal, you know, I guess part of it is think about what you actually need. Because if you ask for too little, and then you're not going to be able to do anything with the money, that's no good. At the same time, sometimes you want to sort of lay it out incrementally. Um, our site is um, one of the only sites I think that lets you edit your goal. So you could also start with something lower and then you could share with people, listen, if you help us get to, you know, $10,000, we would be able to do this. If you mm -hmm. get us to the next level, we'll be able to do this. And it, it also, you know, a lot of the way you set up your campaign is really about setting yourself up to report back on impact. So 
breaking through your goal or changing your goal is really just an excuse to communicate with people and let them know what's going on and how they can help. Great, great answer. Um, the other question I got here, which I'm going to tackle, uh, is about figuring out which social media site is best for your nonprofit. And uh, there really yes. isn't one, you know, size fits all here. But uh, I need to ask this from Sterling, Virginia. And the way that I approach this is every single organization is going to have millennial donors or donors that interact on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, even on LinkedIn. Um, and, and really what I do is I create a big piece of content. Maybe I pick a donor story that I want to share. And then I break that down into smaller subsections. So I'll upload a video on Facebook because many of us know that the videos on Facebook that are actually uploaded through Facebook do better than just posting a YouTube link on Facebook and asking people to view the video that way. I'll then post that same video or a shorter video on YouTube, maybe a really short snippet of that video on Instagram. So you really, you don't have to be coming up with so many new content ideas, but you can be taking one big piece of content and then sharing that mic, you know, we break that down onto the different platforms or even say on Twitter, just a bite-sized quote from that video and then a link that links to the YouTube video for that donor story that someone decided to, to share with your, with your audience there. Um, the other question we got here was if a donor does want to be anonymous, you know, should we be careful about giving shout outs or um, really sharing the, the, the story of this person just pledged? If people maybe want to be anonymous, like, is that something to be aware of? Or should we just assume if they didn't in any way expressively state they want to be anonymous, we can, we can give them a shout out? Yeah, I mean, if you know, every site is set up differently. Our platform actually allows people to choose to be anonymous or to hide their name, show their amount. If somebody chooses that, you're going to know, and I would say you should, you know, respect that. You don't necessarily want to to call people out, but if they don't choose an anonymity sanity, an anonymity setting, their name is already showing up, or at least their first name and their initial in the recent activity feed. And so, actually, talking about it out loud, one easy way to do it: let's say you're not going to tag and thank them on Facebook, but you just want to acknowledge everyone in your in a newsletter. You can do it with first name and initial you know, and not everyone, um, then it's not totally revealed. And if they left that on the site, then chances are they're going to be fine with it to be in a public sphere. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And even just having their, their first name and initial, it still does add to the credibility of your campaign that, hey, this is an actual person that donated to your cause, your cause is cause worthy. Um, it, it makes people more likely to check it out. So right. It's that social proof idea that we were talking about when we were planning is, you know, even um, let's say you guys do that whole idea of like the foot in the door technique where you try and get them to commit by taking a small action. And so maybe it's just, you know, signing a petition or, you know, just filling out like maybe you create a landing page that says like, I support you know, puppies with five legs, whatever it might be. And then they just have to put in their email or check a box. You know, maybe they don't even have to give any personal data, but then that gives you an excuse to make announcements in the way that Sal said, using all the different social media channels, but it's the same piece of content that says a thousand people have already responded to our call, right? This idea that just being able to say everyone's doing it and we are a cause worth paying attention to and getting involved in makes a really big difference. And for those that were on the chat here, there are some really great success stories as well. Um, Claudine, she shared, uh, shared the story. Yes, Giving Tuesday was our end of the year appeal. And we ran through February 1st. Initial goal was to raise 20000 And we closed off at the end of February. And they ended up raising $86,000. Awesome, so Claudine. Really nice. I, I think the people in the audience here, there were some great conversations. And for those of us that are just starting out, it is really possible to, to really take advantage of this day and make it the beginning of a whole new mindset for fundraising online. Uh, that's what I think this is all about, to be honest. Great. Well, guys, uh, we've already uh, gone about 22 minutes over, but hopefully it was worth your while. 
We want to thank you so much. Sal, I want to thank you so much for being here. You did such an awesome job moderating and, and plucking out those questions that people really want to know. Um, like I said, going to send an email, um, hopefully by tonight, from Dana at depositgift.com. And uh, if you don't see it in your inbox, check your spam folder. Um, and you can use it to send a note right back, ask questions. If you want help, you know, getting a campaign set up, we can give you a cheat sheet. And don't forget about the free code. I mean, if you're um, hot to trot or you want to get a campaign set up right now, you can just go uh, to our homepage uh, at depositagift.com. Oops. Click the orange button to get started. And when you get to set two of setup, just enter that code. Um, which is GT Plan 1 6. Uh, you don't have to set up your campaign at all now. You just need to sort of initiate it and grab that code before it expires. Um, so hopefully, we'll be able to help a lot of you. We thank you so much for attending and for your participation. And we wish you the very, very best of luck using the next six months to really pave the way for a successful Giving Tuesday. Sal, do you want to give people your email too? Do you want to put it in the chat box there? In yes. Case, uh, uh, or the box, the email that you like to get. I know, Sal gets a lot of emails, guys. By the way, <laughs> so I, I I didn't want to put it uh, put you on the spot, but I know also you've contributed so much to this conversation. I want people to be able to find you at crowdfunds.com. No. Yeah, I think this has been an amazing webinar. It seems like lots of people have enjoyed the content. If you guys, if you do email me in the subject line, just say that you're coming from this webinar or mention deposit a gift in some ways, just so I can pluck out your email um, from the volume that I get. That'd be- And he'll treat you as a VIP, as, <laughs> as will I and as will our team. That's the thing. If you use that upgrade code or you let us know you heard heard about it here, um, the team, both teams, both at Deposit a Gift and Crowd Crux, we will um, give you guys you know extra special treatment. So with that, have a wonderful day. Good luck. Please use us as a resource. Uh, we're here for you in any way we can. Um, and I'm going to uh, end this webinar now. If you could just um, wait one second, a survey is going to come up. This webinar costs nothing, but hopefully if you could just give us your feedback, we'd really appreciate it. And with that, Thanks we so wish much, you a guys. wonderful day. Thanks, Al. Have a good one. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.